Welcome everyone. This is the oral abstract presentation session for day one. My name is Allison Peck and I am one of the uh, co-founders of Cure VCP Disease. Uh, we want to thank each of the abstract uh, submitters for all the excellent work that they did. We actually extended the time um, we were going to give because we were blown away with the level of um, the uh, research presented to us. Um, so today um, we're going to have um, three clinical presentations followed by three preclinical presentations. Um, we've, um, I also want to invite everyone to visit the Expo Center uh, to, uh, as each of the abstract um, submitters had a presented um, a video recording. Um, Rod, are you uh, ready? Good afternoon, my name is Rod Carlo Coulombras. I'm a medical student at William Carey University College of Osteopathic Medicine, also a junior um, specialist at University of California, Irvine. And today I'm presenting one of my work titled MRI and Functional Analysis of Thigh Muscles and VCP Myopathy Disease. Okay, so the purpose of this study is first to correlate the semi-quantitative scores of fat infiltration with MRI-based fat fraction analysis. Second is to demonstrate the association of such scoring with functional measures in affected patients and non-affected subjects. And lastly, to characterize the specific patterns of chronic VCP myopathy and semi-quantitative methods. So MRI or magnetic resonance imaging is a non-invasive tool for evaluation of soft tissues that can help diagnose neuromuscular disorders. It can provide information regarding fat infiltration and muscle volume decrease. MRI is also commonly used for diagnosis of inherited myopathies. Okay, so in this study, we recruited 20 participants, 12 were affected, eight were non-affected, and within the non-affected group, two VCP carriers were included. And the mean um, age at visit for the VCP myopathy group is 50 years old. The mean disease duration is 10 years. So in this study, we utilized two methods to determine the muscle fat infiltration of the thigh. The first one being the semi-quantitative assessment, where the degree of fat infiltration was graded visually by a radiologist according to the five-point scale scoring depicted in our table right here. So as you can see, if the muscle showed no traces of um, increased intensity in the MRI image, indicating there's no fat infiltration, then it is scored stage zero or zero. However, if the um, entire muscle is completely replaced by increased signal intensity, meaning that the muscle is completely replaced by fat, then that particular muscle is um, scored four. The second method used in the study is via the termination of the fat fraction value. So how we obtain this value is depicted in this flow chart. So we um, utilized T1 weighted MRI images where we first corrected the shading for um, and or intensity and homogeneity, and then segmented for different um, tissue types using MyPath software. Also manual, um, manual muscle segmentation of the bilateral thigh muscles were, per was, were performed by a radiologist using the MyPath software, software as well. Then the fat fraction value in each muscle um, was calculated. Okay, and here we, we can see that the right and the left um, thigh muscles where we assess for the fat infiltration in the midsection of the thigh, where we can see our rectus femoris, our vasti muscles, okay, our sartorius, our adductor longus, adductor magnus right here, our, um, our semimembranosus, semitendinosus, and our um, biceps femoris, which are visible in this um, plane. Um, and then we use all these muscles in our study, okay? So by visual observation of the MRI images, we can see that as the VCP myopathy progresses, the fat infiltration within the thigh muscles bilaterally increases as well. So we have here um, a control and a carrier for comparison. And for the control, we should not see any increased intensity or white within the muscle. And now you are seeing the disease duration or um, the affected MRI images starting from two years all the way to 20 years. Okay, and here you will observe um, that most muscles are being replaced with fat as depicted by the increased intensity 
or whites within the muscle. We can see that the um, vasti muscles bilaterally were the most affected, especially in the 20 year um, disease duration. Okay, so in this figure, we we um, comparing the association between the fat fraction, fat fraction value and the semi-quantitative scale scores. And as we can see, we, we see a statistically significant stepwise, in, stepwise increase or positive correlation, indicating that the severe staging corresponds to a higher fat fraction. Next is, as we analyze all the muscles of the thigh based on the fat fraction values, we found that the vast thigh, sartorius, and adductor magnus muscles in the um, VCP myopathy group demonstrated a, a significantly higher fat infiltration compared to the non-affected groups. We also found that the adductor magnus, uh, longus, I'm sorry, adductor longus and rectus femoris were less infiltrated. This gives us an understanding of the disease specific pattern of degeneration for the VCP disease. Here you're looking at the five point scale scores of each muscle to the left and right um, thighs per patients organized in increasing disease progression. And as we can see, there are more yellow or stage four scored in the thigh muscles of patients with um, longer disease duration. Earliest seen at five years and worse at 20 years um, disease duration, supporting our initial visual observation that as the disease progresses, the fatty infiltration increases. We also see that the vast eye, um, um, yeah, the vast eye, sartorius and adductor magnus have the most yellow or stage four scored depicted in our red arrows right here. Okay, again, we're looking at each muscle of the left and the right thighs per patient organized increasing disease progression, but this time, instead of using the um, scoring, the semi-quantitative scoring, we're seeing the five point scale score, um, sorry, the fat fraction values or scoring. And we can see here that the high fat fraction values are seen in the thigh muscles of patients with longer disease duration, seen in earliest, seen earliest at five years and worse at 20 years. Again, supporting our initial conclusion. Here we are looking at the functional measure where we are looking for the association between the six minute walk test and the five, five point scale scores using linear regression. Here as well, we aggregated the thigh muscles into their functional compartments. We see, um, as you can see here, we saw a statistically significant and strong negative um, association between the six minute walk test and the five point scale scores in the left and right flexors and extensors in the VCP disease patients. Essentially, all, compart all compartments shows on the same pattern where with increasing five point scale scores, we see a decline in functionality on six minute walk tests. So in conclusion, in this study, we can see that the five point Five point semi quantitative scale is a viable modality which can provide equivalent accuracy as quantification of fat infiltration specifically for IBM PFD patients. In addition, such scale demonstrates strong association with functional measures such as in six minute walk tests. We also found that the vasti, sartorius, and adductor magnus were most affected by fat infiltration, while the adductor longus and the rectus femoris were better preserved. Next is in this study, we found that the muscle specific pattern of fat infiltration, uh, infiltration delineates supporting evidence in the differential diagnosis of VCP myopathy relative to other acquired or genetic neuromuscular diseases. And lastly, this method and associated muscle specific pattern provide a promising non-invasive and widely accessible strategy in clinical practice to, initially, um, to initial evaluation and follow up of VCP myopathy. Lastly, I want to thank all the colleagues who contributed to this work and to our PIs and also acknowledge, want to acknowledge um, the patients and families who volunteered their time for the study. And that being said, um, thank you. And if you have any questions, please email me. And thank you so much, uh, Rod. I, I didn't introduce you when we started. I'm so sorry. This no. is Rod Carlos <laughs> Columbus of the University of California, Irvine. Thank you so much for an excellent presentation on MRI. Thank you. Next, we have Aliyah Shamar. She is also with uh, the University of California, Irvine, and she will be presenting on the high prevalence of um, frontotemporal dementia in Hispanic families or for Hispanic families. 
Uh, my name is Ali Ashmara. I'm a research specialist uh, at the Kimonos lab here at QCI. And today I'd like to share this study about the high prevalence of uh, frontotemporal dementia in females in five Hispanic families with the R159H uh, VCP multisystem proteinopathy. As uh, you all know, the manifestations of VCP disease are uh, inclusion body myopathy, typically reported at the frequency of uh, 90%. Paget disease of the bone at 42%, frontotemporal dementia at 30%, and ALS at 9%. Here we report five Hispanic families with the R159H mutation uh, in which FTD was the most prevalent features most frequently in females. And uh, as you can see, denoted by the arrows. And uh, in these families, we found only one case of Paget disease of the bone, as you can see in family one. Uh, we have only four pedigrees of the families. Uh, family five, uh, the patient was adopted, so uh, no pedigree was available. So we looked at these pedigrees and we have 39 affected individuals and we compared the clinical manifestations in these uh, five families to the previously reported cohort uh, by Elevedi and colleagues uh, back in 2018. So, um, the clinical manifestations in that bigger cohort uh, was um, report, reported myopathy at 90%. However, in our cohort, the myopathy was only about 36%. And uh, frontotemporal dementia in our cohort was um, almost 72% compared to the 30% reported in the bigger cohort. And uh, there was only one uh, patient with Paget disease of the bone, uh, and that's 33% uh, compared to the 42% uh, reported in the bigger cohort. However, we did not find a significant difference in the incidence of uh, ALS. From these 39 individuals, we selected 10 cases uh, on whom we have detailed clinical information. And again, we looked at the various uh, manifestations. And here um, you can see, again, the incidence of myopathy is lower at 60%. Uh, uh, that's comparing to the 90% reported by the bigger cohort. Um, and then uh, frontotemporal dementia was also higher at 40%. And you can see it's only presented in females um, in uh, these 10 cases, and there were no cases of patch disease of the bone in these 10 individuals. And what was interesting was the later age of onset for the frontotemporal dementia at 65 years. And we compared that to the bigger cohort uh, and they had the frontotemporal dementia age of onset was uh, almost 56 uh, years. And in the next, um, Next, uh, sorry. Yeah, next few slides, we're gonna look at some of the cases that we just saw in the table. So uh, this is case for muscle biopsy, and um, it has the typical manifestations of inclusion body myopathy associated with PCP disease. So on panel A, you can see some of the internalized uh, nuclei and um, variability in the fiber uh, size. And in panels B and C, you can see the, uh, the REMD vacuoles. Uh, panels D and E, you can see the autophagy markers. Uh, here is LC3 and here is TDP43 positivity within the vacuoles. The next slide is our uh, case five, who is a 72-year-old female with memory impairment started at age 68 years old. and for panels A and B are the axial uh, sections of the CT scan of the brain, and you can see the uh, atrophy of the frontal and temporal lobes, mo mostly on the left side. And you can also see the, the dilatation of the uh, ventricles. Here is the lateral ventricle, and in panel C with the coronal sec sec section, you can see the dilatation of the uh, lateral and third uh, ventricles, mostly on the left side.
Next slide is our case six, who is a 63-year-old female with progressive functional decline. And uh, we're looking at her MRI of the brain on the left side when she was 58 years old and on, the, on this side on the right side when she's 62 years old. And you can see the progressive dilatation of the la uh, lateral and third ventricles and the pro progressive atrophy of the frontal and temporal lobes. And for panel C and D, we're looking at the sagittal section midline of the MRI of the brain, and we see the progressive thinning of the corpus callosum. So this is a 58 years old, and this is a 62 years old. And the next slide is the same patient, uh, frontal uh, brain, the frontal uh, lobe biopsy of her brain. And for panels A and B, we have the HNE, with, which shows normal neuronal laminations. However, in panel C and D, we have the TDP43 translocation into the cytoplasm and uh, multiple neurons. And this study highlights the high prevalence of dementia uh, in these Hispanic families, and mostly in females. So FTD in females with this variant was significantly higher at 85% compared to females with FTD uh, with other BCP variants. Uh, myopathy and Paget disease was uh, lower in our cohort. And uh, what was interesting was the late onset of uh, FTD in the 10 cases that uh, we reported. Uh, the age of incidence was 65 years and was mostly seen in females. And none of those females had myopathy. And this suggests that maybe this variant may be milder in, this, in these Hispanic uh, families. So because uh, lower incidence of myopathy and they are living uh, longer, as uh, Dr. Kimonis discussed earlier today, that the main cause of death uh, for BCP disease is the respiratory failure and cardiomyopathy associated with the myopathy component of BCP disease. So if they are having lower myopathy, they're living longer and displaying the, temp or the temporal dementia. Uh, we also uh, compared uh, Paget disease incidence uh, in uh, other uh, families reported in the literatures with the same mutation and was higher than our cohort. And the possible explanation could be their background, which was uh, of European descent and uh, the epidemiology of Paget disease is known to be higher in a uh, population of Northern European ancestry. And uh, we have previously reported two families with the R159C variant um, with no evidence of Paget. However, further studies are needed to identify if there's a mechanism for a possible protective effect for this variant for Paget. Finally, I would like to thank the patients, their families, and their healthcare providers for their collaboration, and uh, I'd like to thank um, Cure BCP Disease for this opportunity to share our work. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Aya. Up next, we have Marinella Scava. Um, she's joining us from Europe, and I wanted to ask you: Are you? Uh, would you like us to share what we have? Or are you planning to? Uh, to present live, what we prepared earlier. I think it would be better what we prepared earlier, just in case, because my connection was not so good a few minutes ago. Okay, good. All right, we're prepared to go either way. I just wanted to I check with you. Any problem? Thank you. My name is Chiara. I'm a neurologist and PhD student at John Walton Muscular Dystrophy Center in the city of Newcastle upon Tyne, UK. I'm presenting the study, clinical classification of novel variants variants in the valocine containing protein gene associated with multisystemic proteinopathy. I have no disclosures. The purpose of this study was to report the novel variants identified in the BCP gene, identified in the BCP International Multicentric Study, and to propose an integrated framework to help clinicians to assess the pathogenicity of BCP variants. The BCP International Multicentric Study was a retrospective descriptive study carried out in 51 centers from 24 countries in which adult patients above 18 years old 
with a pathogenic or likely pathogenic mutation in the BCP gene were enrolled if a patient had a variant of uncertain significant mutation in the BCP gene, uh, the patient was uh, able to be enrolled if a positive a family segregation analysis uh, was found or an in silico analysis showed the pathogenicity of the variant. All the mutations were centrally reviewed by an experienced geneticist from the Sean Walton Muscular Dystrophy Center. In order to determine the pathogenicity of the novel variants, a pathogenic degree score was developed, and the following clinical or ancillary test uh, features were allocated a certain score. So one point was allocated is a core multisystemic proteinopathy phenotype was identified in the patient carried the variant, such as myopathy, dementia, patient disease of the bone, motor neuron disease, or Parkinsonism. One point was allocated as well is if a first degree relative uh, with a multisystemic proteinopathy core phenotype was identified. One point was allocated to the presence of rimmer vacuoles or protein inclusions uh, in the muscle biopsy. And one point was allocated to two variants. Um, these variants were um, mutations uh, P isoleucine 216 methionine and P isoleucine 369 threonine because. Uh, those variants were identified in more than one family in the cohort of the novel uh, patients identified in the BCP international study. Two points were allocated when a positive um, segregation analysis was done in the, in the family. Half a point to those variants present in residues previously described in multisystemic proteinopathy patients, and half a point was allocated if a symmetric or patchy asymmetric fat replacement um, identified as a hyperintensity in T1 weight MRI of the tight or left of the patient was identified. So based on the sum of this point that each variant um, gathered, they were able to be labeled in three categories. If more than, if three or more than, than three points were uh, obtained, the variant was labeled as high likelihood of pathogenicity. If 2 to 2.5 points were obtained, it was labeled as probably pathogenic variant. And if 1 or 2, 1.5 points, it was labeled as uncertain pathogenicity. Moving forward to the results, um, I will first present a summary of the result of the whole, whole cohort to be able to understand where the novel variants were obtained. So a total of 233 patients were enrolled in the BCP international study. However, 11 were excluded from the analysis, seven because of they were asymptomatic carrier, three patients didn't have enough uh, clinical data, and one patient was duplicated. The majority of the patients, the 71%, were males. The mean age at symptom onset was 45.6 years, and the mean age at last assessment, 56.6 uh, years. A total of 54 variants were identified, and the 99.1% were had an heterozygous presentation. One patient had a compound heterozygous presentation, and one patient a homozygous presentation. The right chart describes the variants in which more than four patients were identified. In bold are the four variants which were the most frequent one. And uh, it is important to highlight that the two most frequent variants, the two, the first two variants, uh, so variant C464GA and C463CT are located in exon 5 and both variants affected the hotspot uh, position in the BCP protein. So they changed an arginine for, a, for another amino acid in the position 155. Of the 54 variants identified, 19 were novel ones, which belong to 24 patients from 20 families. And mirroring the result of the whole cohort, 21% were male. The mean age at symptom onset was 45.5 years, and the mean age at last assessment, 55 years. 
regarding clinical features in these 24 patients, the 21 had muscle weakness, and in the bar graph in the right, we can see the distribution of the muscle weakness. So 33% of the patient had proximal and distal weakness in the four limbs, followed by in 19 of the patients who had proximal and distal lower limb weakness. It is important to highlight that 24% of the patient had axial weakness as well. Cognitive impairment was found in 25% of the patient and 21% 20, had Pachet disease of the bone. It was curious that only two patients had the classic triad of in, inclusion body myopathy, Pachet disease of the bone and frontotemporal dementia. And one patient uh, had an isolated Pachet disease of the bone and only one patient had cardiac impairment which was a dilated cardiomyopathy diagnosed by ultrasonography. Other clinical features in these patients with the novel variant was that 33% had scapular weakening, 17% dysautonomy, and 17% as well has vulvar symptom manifested as dysphagia and dysarthria. It is uh, remarkable that patients with vulvar symptom always had uh, other lower motor neuron signs except for one patient, and two patients had a polyneuropathy. Regarding the family history, the majority of the patients, the 75%, had a positive family history of the first degree relative with the uh, core multisystemic proteinopathy um, clinical feature, and the most frequent one was motor neuron disease and dementia. However, a quarter of the patient, the 25%, didn't have a positive, a positive family history. In this chart, we can see the 14 patients from 11 families whose variants were labeled following the proposed score as high likelihood of pathogenicity. As we can see, the majority of the patients had muscle weakness and a positive family history, followed by other positive um, clinical features as well as the result of ancillary tests, such as a biopsy of, or a muscle MRI. It is important to highlight that only five families from the 11 families had a segregation analysis done. However, in the rest of the family, the day variant were still able um, to be uh, identified as of high likelihood of pathogenicity following the score proposed despite not having a family segregation analysis done. In this chart, we can see that five patients from five independently families um, in which their variants were classified as probable pathogenic variants. We can see that all the patients had muscle weakness and four patients had a positive muscle biopsy. Um, however, the presence of other clinical features, family history, a muscle MRI or family segregation analysis was uh, reduced. And in this chart, we can see the five patients as well from five independently families in whose uh, variants were labeled as of uncertain pathogenicity. And we can see that all the patients have muscle weakness. However, other supporting um, clinical history or ancillary test results were lacking. In this chart, um, we intend to summarize the 19 novel uh, variants identified. Being an autosomal dominant disease, all the patients had an heterozygous presentation and all the mutations were missense mutation except from one mutation, which is the one which is highlighted in blue, which was a small uh, deletion insertion. And all the mutations were located out of the hotspot position in the a BCP protein, which was the 155 55 position, except from the one that is highlighted in green. In the scheme below, we can see the first scheme represents the BCP gene with, the, with its uh, 17 exons, and we can see that uh, eight, 18 of the 19 variants were located between exon 2 and 10, which affects uh, the end domain and the ITPase D1 domain of the PCP protein. It is uh, important that 64 of the 68 already known variants in the PCP gene affect as well the end domain and the ITPase D1 domain. 
However, one variant was located in exon 14, affecting the ITPS D2 domain of the BCP protein, which is the domain that had the enzymatic activity in the protein. So, in conclusion, this study described novel variants associated with multisystemic proteinopathy in BCP and intend to provide a tool for clinicians in the evaluation of BCP variants. The proposed score could be helpful when performing segregation family analysis is not feasible. And in order to understand whether these variants alter biochemical processes that might indicate functional defects in the BCP protein, cell based studies are being carried out. I would like to thank Dr. Shoridias Manera and Coral Way for the variable um, input in this study, as well as the rest of the author, and mainly to all the colleagues that are participating in the BCP International Study Group. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Marinella. Up next, we have uh, Polin Chu, and he's, gonna, he's from Arizona State, and he's going to be presenting uh, the, his abstract structural and functional analysis of disease link P97 AT pace mutant. Thank you so much. So hello, hello everyone. Thank you, Alison, for the introduction. Um, I would like to thank the organizer for giving me an opportunity to share my work here. And in the next few minutes, I'm going to talk about structure and functional analysis on the disease P97 ADPS complex. And this work could not be done without a tight collaboration with Chivin Joe's lab in Caltech. And my student, um, Prabhasha Nandi, also have a poster in the uh, at the conference. So if you'd like to know more details, please find her poster, and we will be very happy to discuss any questions you may have. So um, you may know this, uh, you may be familiar with these uh, pictures very much. And then I just want to quickly uh, review the molecular architecture of the P97 ADPase. So P97 has an N-terminal domain and followed by two tandem D1 and D2 ADPase domain. And most of the P97 cofactors might to N-terminal domain or C-terminal tail to modulate P97 ADPase function. And single amino acid mutation on P97 leads to disease of P uh, MSP1 and um, IBM PFD. And then mutation are primarily on the N-terminal domain or ND1 linker. And arginine uh, R155H is the most predominant mutation. So the arginine 155 is located in the N-terminal domain, which has distinct uh, up and down conformations that associate with P97 function. And all current P97 current mutant uh, structures show the N-terminal domain in all up conf conformations. And P97 disease mutants show higher activity than the wild type. And the arginine 155 does not directly interact with D1 or D2 ATPase. And it is not clear how this mutation induces a structure change of uh, for the elevated ADPS function. P47 is an essential P97 uh, cofactor that involves in Golgi membrane reassembly, and it bites to the N-terminal domain and it inhibits the P97 ADPS function. And the distance of the P47 binding site is also very far away from the two ADPS domain. So how P47 structurally, structurally impacts the P97 ADPS function is also not very clear. So to find the relationship between the mutant structure and function, so we first pursue using single particle cry em to directly visualize the P97 and P47, P97, P47 mutant assembly. So we, we assemble the, the two proteins in vitro and then image in, in using the cry em methods. And then the 3D reconstruction show two populations in the sample. One is P97 dodecamer without P47 binding. And then the other is the P97, P47 assembly. And the ratio of the particle numbers show a large uh, population of P97 dodecamer, and its uh, and, uh, terminal domain are all in up conf conformation. So the dodecameric uh, formation is mediated via two um, D2 rings packing against uh, each other. The packing is stabilized by hydrogen bonding and the pi pi stacking force of the uh, uh, aromatic side chains. And another surprising thing is that we we um, didn't find in the wild type is that we found no nucleotide densities in the nucleotide binding pockets. Because we did not supply any nucleotides when we assembled the complex. So to test whether the empty nucleotide binding pocket is the reason for the mutant dodecameric formation, we generate two uh, D1 and D2 Walker A mutants to mimic the R155H mutant without nucleotide binding because the Walker A mutant does not bind the nucleotides. 
We then use the negative stain EM to visualize the oligomerization states of the mutants. And we found that the majority of the particles are dodecamer and the ratio are more than the uh, R15H mutants. So that the no nucleotide occupancy likely favors the dodecameric formations of the P97R55H uh, mutants. Because the dodecamer does not bind nucleotides, it is likely an inactive form. To test whether different nucleotide states affect the stability of the dodecamer, we assemble the mutant with the P47 in the presence of ADP or ADP gamma S. And we found out that the dodecamer only presents 1.4% in the presence of ADP. And no dodecamer was found when the ADP gamma S was present. So we learned that the nucleotide presents destabilize the dotecamer, dissociating in uh, dissociating the um, proteins into two functional hexamer. So we we then want to ask if the dotecamer seems not functional, what would be the structural implication for this dotecamer uh, then? So the recent structures suggest a hand over hand uh, model for protein segregation and degradations. So we hypothesize that this highly symmetric dotecamer may limit the mobility between the monomers to, to prohibit the hand over hand movements. So these spatial uh, restrictions may also interfere or disfavor the domain communications and block the ATPs functions. And then uh, when, eight, uh, so also when P97 binds to an uh, ATP competitive inhibitor cb 5083 and then P97 becomes inactive. And then the structures also found that it's a dodecameric form. And this may tell us that there could be a common structure arrangement of the P97 in the dodecamer that disable the ADPS function. And another case that we found is that the domain, uh, mis uh, domain miscommunication by dodecameric form is an allosteric inhibitor bound P97 structures. And uh, in this way, we collaborate with the NCI and X team and investigate an inhibitors mites in the D1, D2 interface. And we found that the result, uh, the molar ratio of the dodecamer is almost the same as the P97R158H mutant. Similarly, we saw the conformational change uh, of our arginine fingers when P47 binds to the uh, uh, P97 mutants in the presence of ATP gamma S. We test the functions and then find out the result shows a dramatic functional reduction on these arginine fingers mutant. And when the, argin, uh, when the arginine fingers were mutated, and these data help us to link the impact of the NDD uh, mutations or P47 cofactor binding to the arginine finger conformational change. So um, the other thing that we want to know, because the P47 sites are away, uh, binding sites are away from the ADPS domains. So the intermediate linkers that connect the NTD, the intermediate domain, D1 and D2 may play a key role communicating these functional domains. So to understand how this linker communicate between the D1 and D2, we first focus on looking at the D1, D2 linker. And the previous mutagenesis study showed that the uh, losing 464 on the D1, D2 linker is conserved and plays a critical role in regulating ATP its functions. Then functional measurements uh, seems shows that it seems that the size and charge of the side chain is not critical for regulating the ATP its function. But it is interesting that when the losing was mutated to poorly, and the ATP its function reduced to only less than a half. And then we then use the single particle cry EM to visualize the mutant structure. And then we found that the structures arrange the uh, N-terminal domain heterogeneously and with four um, down NDD and a one tilted and a one up conformations. And also the six D1, D2 linkers uh, are shown in the different conformations. So lastly, we superimpose the structures compared to the wire type and we found out that it has a slightly uh, structure change and this may, uh, and because the proline has a restricted phi and psi torsional angles, which may confer less uh, mobility of the D1, D2 linkers. This may indicate that the rigidity given by the torsional strain of this mutant and disturbs the communications between the functional domains. Um, I'm running out of time, but less, the most important thing is that I want to thank that uh, who uh, work on this project, Prabhasha, my students, and also DY and UP in the facilities, all the works on the EM, also on the uh, web bench. And also Petra is my center directors and support my research. And also thanks to my collaborator, Cui Fen and uh, Yan Zhuang in uh, University of Michigan. Thank you. Thank you so much, Colin, for your presentation. And up next, we have Stephanie Moon from the University of Michigan. 
and her uh, abstract is on coupling and translation of of quality control MRN targeting to stress granules. You'll have to excuse me for my my introduction. So it looks like Stephanie that you are ready, and I'm going to hand this off to you. All right. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I'm learning a lot at this conference. It's been a really um, good time for me to learn more about VCP. Um, I'm an RNA biologist at the University of Michigan, and I'm studying a role that uh, is just now being um, kind of uncovered, and that is how VCP interacts with RNA in the cell. So my lab is really interested in how cells respond to stressful conditions or challenges in their environment. And they use this molecular signaling pathway uh, called the integrated stress response. Basically, all of these different conditions that can cause uh, disease activate the stress response pathway. And what has to happen is the cell has to stop its gene expression program and kind of reboot everything and say, hey, we're in a stressful condition. I need to um, express new genes um, and kind of halt everything until we figure out how to adapt to the stress. And so what interests our lab is how uh, this stress response can go wrong and cause different diseases. So it's associated with lots of really basic fundamental processes like um, cell division, sensing nutrients in the environment, even learning and memory in the brain. Um, and it's also associated with neurodegeneration and conditions associated with aging. Um, and many genetic disorders as well. So we're trying to figure out what goes wrong uh, with the stress response to cause human disease. So um, one aspect of the stress response is, like I said, RNA is really highly regulated. So when a cell experiences stress, it turns off translation, kind of expresses very specific stress-induced genes. RNAs relocalize into these biomolecular condensates, including stress granules. And uh, what I did as a postdoc was try and investigate how stress granules are regulated in the cell using single molecule imaging technologies, which I'll be talking about today. And in my lab, I'm following up on this work uh, using similar techniques as well. The reason we got interested in VCP from a, a biology standpoint or a scientific standpoint is because VCP actually regulates stress granules in ways that we don't really understand right now. Um, so we decided to try and take a closer look at VCP and stress granule biology and RNA regulation um, because several other papers had come out over the years that suggest that when VCP is inhibited, or even in some cases, pathogenic mutations of VCP uh, can actually inhibit stress granule disassembly. But the mechanisms by which this happens aren't very well understood. Um, and as you all know, there's many pathogenic alleles of VCP that are implicated in disease and stress granule-like inclusion bodies are actually found in many affected tissues from patients. So we're wondering if there's a relationship between altered stress granule regulation and perhaps these inclusion bodies or the stress response in the disease context. Um, so we use this really exciting new technique that was developed by our collaborators to actually let us image single RNA molecules in a human cell that's still alive. So you can see in this movie here, these little red and green dots are actually mRNAs inside of a cell, and you can see that they're actively translating. So this is really exciting for us because we could test hypotheses about how VCP inhibitors would actually affect RNA. So I use this technique, worked with uh, the Stasevich lab to try and figure out what role VCP might be playing in RNA and stress granule biology um, using the single molecule imaging. And we actually found that RNAs seem to remain trapped in translation complexes when you inhibit VCP. Um, and that was a really unexpected, surprising finding for us because we thought VCP was primarily involved in stress granule disassembly. Uh, and we did a bunch of other experiments that are now published in the Journal of Cell Biology last year, um, where we showed that VCP is actually required for the assembly of many mRNAs into stress granules. So they seem to be involved in stress granule formation, not just stress granule disassembly. Um, and initial experiments we did to try and see how pathogenic VCP alleles would affect this process, we found that uh, certain mRNAs were more enriched in stress granules when we expressed these alleles. 
So this suggests that this might be a really unexpected um, impact of VCP mutations on the cell is in RNA biology and stress granule biology. Um, so in this study that we published, we found uh, evidence that certain stress conditions actually cause ribosomes to stall on mRNAs, and VCP plays a role in perhaps resolving these stalled ribosomes so that RNAs can be accumulating inside stress granules and help stress granules assemble. And disease contexts resulting from defects in proteostasis, such as VCP alleles, could impact this um, pathway. Um, so we think that there's perhaps two roles that VCP is playing in stress granule and RNA biology. One is this role upstream of stress granule formation where it seems to be involved in translation. And then the other is in really how stress granules disassemble. So my lab is actually creating cell culture systems and doing more experiments using the single molecule imaging technique to understand the molecular mechanisms that VCP does this. Um, so I'd like to thank the members of my lab and uh, the people from Roy Parker's lab where I did my postdoc, our collaborators, and funding sources. Thank you so much, Stephanie. <laughs> Up next, we have uh, Brittany Alsted from the University of Michigan. Oh, sorry, from Tufts University. I'm sorry, Brittany. And she's going to talk about the regulation of ER proteins. Okay, so hi everyone. Um, my name is Brittany Alstead and I'm currently a graduate student in the Raman lab at Tufts um, in Boston. And today I'll tell you about my project which highlights a novel role for the P97 adapter UBXN1 in maintaining ER protein homeostasis. So recent reports have really highlighted how protein misfolding, subsequent aggregation, and then resultant stress generation in the endoplasmic reticulum has really emerged as a major mechanism of disease, contributing to the pathology of diseases as diverse as cystic fibrosis to various neurodegenerative disorders. And as the ER processes about a third of the cellular proteome, it really is critical to identify and then dispose of these misfolded proteins in order to ensure the homeostatic balance within the ER. And in order to do this, the ER has evolved specific quality control processes. Um, these include the unfolded protein response, which senses the misfolded protein burden within the ER and signals downstream of three stress sensors, PERC, IRE1, and ATF6. And this will ultimately induce a transcriptional response um, that activates an adaptive phase of the UPR where translation is inhibited um, and uh, ER chaperones and ERAD components are, are induced in order to uh, resolve stress. And then if ER stress is not alleviated, um, a terminal apoptotic cascade is activated. And this can be especially devastating for post-mitotic cells like neurons. And then in parallel, ER-associated degradation um, identifies and then disposes of terminally misfolded species with the help of P97 and the proteasome. And while mechanisms like ERAD are very well defined, processes that prevent protein misfolding in the ER are still largely unknown. But recent reports have begun to highlight that there are mechanisms that act even prior to protein misfolding in the ER, um, termed preemptive quality control pathways. And interestingly, um, our lab has characterized a novel role for P97 and its adapter UBXN1 uh, in preemptive quality control. So I know that this um, slide is just like an overly simplified version of uh, the P97 network, but I really just wanted to highlight that um, the way that P97 um, participates in such a wide variety of processes and is recruited to so many different substrates is through its interaction with these process specific adapter proteins. And our lab is really interested in characterizing the activity of these um, adapter complexes to better globally understand P97 function throughout the cell. And specifically, my work focuses on um, an unchar well, a poorly characterized adapter, um, the UBX domain containing protein UBXN1. So um, initially we first asked the question, um, what are the implications of loss of UBXN1 on the cellular proteome? Uh, so a, to answer this question, a postdoc in our lab, Rakesh Ganji, um, completed quantitative tandem mass tag proteomics on a CRISPR-Cas9 UBXN1 knockout cell line. And he finds that uh, the data indicate that there is a defect in ER quality control when UBXN1 is absent. And this is evidenced by um, an increased abundance of ER proteins, um, many with a that play a role in ER quality control, 
Um, and we think that this is a um, compensatory response to respond to ER stress. And from what we previously published, we know that this defect in ER quality control is not due to a defect in ERAD as uh, depletion of UBXN1 by siRNA does not impact the turnover of a panel of GFP-tagged ERAD clients, whereas importantly, depletion of P97 by siRNA um, does halt the turnover of these clients, which tracks with what we know of P97's essential role in ERAD. So the goal of my work was to uh, really characterize how this cytosolic adapter, UBXN1, uh, maintains uh, ER health. And so in order to do this, I wanted to uh, characterize the implications of loss of UBXN1 on ER stress induction as well as UPR signaling. Um, so I initially wanted to determine uh, which of the UPR arms were active upon loss of UBXN1, as this will better help us characterize the potential mechanism of how it may be functioning here. So initially to uh, examine PERC target proteins, I induced ER stress with DTT for the indicated time points and find that in knockout cells, there is a, uh, a robust increase in um, PERC target proteins, including phosphorylation of EIF to alpha, which will inhibit uh, protein translation, as well as the transcription factor ATF4. Uh, in parallel, um, ear stress induction by DTT additionally leads to significant ATF6 and terminal processing and activation, um, which is evidenced here by this faster migrating band on the gel. Um, as we know that ATF6 is activated by cleavage in the Golgi to generate the active transcription factor. IRE1 um, is activated and forms these higher order oligomers, uh, which cluster together and then can be imaged by immunofluorescence. So I utilized a uh, GFP tagged IRE1 cell line. And you can see here in this untreated sample that the GFP signal takes on this diffuse staining pattern where upon ER stress induction uh, by tunicomycin, it clusters together, uh, which can then be imaged and quantified. So I see that upon depletion of UBXN1 with siRNA, there is a significant increase in the percentage of cells with these IRE1 foci, as well as a significant increase in the number of IRE1 foci per cell. And downstream of IRE1 activation, um, XBP1 mRNA is spliced by the endoribonuclease activity of IRE1 to generate this um, active transcription factor XBP1S. So I um, uh, assessed levels of XBP1S by real-time PCR and see that uh, upon ER stress induction by Thapsigargan, there is a significant increase in XBP1S expression uh, when you, in knockout cells. So as I previously mentioned, the UPR uh, ultimately ends in a transcriptional response. So I wanted to determine if downstream targets um, of the UPR arms were induced uh, in knockout cells. And I utilized real-time PCR um, to assess a panel of these, of these genes and see that there is significant activation or significant induction um, of targets downstream of each arm. So just to sum up what I've shown thus far, UBXM1 loss generates this apparent disruption in ER protein homeostasis, which results in ER stress um, and UPR activation. So the question that still remains that I would like to answer is by which mechanism P97 and UBXM1 is maintaining ER homeostasis? So we previously published that um, the P P97 and UBXM1 are essential to the clearance of mislocalized BAG6 clients that fail to enter the ER. Um, so we initially hypothesized that it's possible that these mislocalized proteins may be inappropriately entering or interacting with the ER in some capacity. So to um, examine this, I assessed the glycosylation status of a panel of, a panel of um, ER targeted clients. And I'm just showing you one example here of the prion protein. Um, as we can really efficiently um, distinguish between the different forms of prion protein by Western. So I labeled the different forms here um, and you can kind of see that image on the left as well. And so we wanted to, we asked the question of, is there um, a difference in abundance of one of these forms of prion protein? But we interestingly see that when UBX someone is depleted, there seems to be um, an accumulation of all three. So then we asked the, 
we ask the question of, uh, is there increased translation in these um, when UBX and one is absent? So uh, to assess global translation rates, I utilized a sunset assay um, that utilizes pyromycin labeling in cells. So as you can see here, pyromycin um, closely resembles the three prime terminal um, end of this tRNA, which means that it can occupy the acceptor site on ribosomes. And then it can be um, incorporated into uh, elongating peptides. This can then be um, assessed by Western. And as you can see here in UBX and one knockout cells, there is um, increased pyromycin incorporation into proteins, which um, points towards a, um, an increase in protein synthesis in these cells. Um, to then examine uh, translational shutoff, I induced ER stress with DTT, which if you'll remember will um, inhibit protein translation and see that there is delayed shutoff um, of translation in these knockout cells. And then finally, I utilized cyclohexamide to inhibit uh, protein translation and see that there is a delay turnover of substrates in these knockout cells as well. Um, so future studies will be, I will want to determine if this apparent increase in translation um, is what is possibly generating this ER stress and UPR phenotype. So I just wanted to thank everyone in my lab, um, as well as Tufts um, and the CMDB program and my funding sources. Thank you. Great job, Brittany. Uh, great job, all presenters. This was really good. Uh, excellent. I think Chris may have um, hit the nail on the head in his comment.